Our meeting uh, this morning is a book launch for Lenin for Today, and our speaker is the author John Molyneux. Uh, John's a uh, long-standing member of the Socialist Workers' Party um, for many years in Portsmouth, now in Ireland, where he's also uh, a member of People Before Profit um, and editor of the Irish Marxist Review, which is on sale here at Bookmarks. So I'll uh, ask John to speak now. <laughs> Wait till you hear what I've got to say. <laughs> that's, that's a, a lie. Um, uh, right, first of all, I, I, it's lovely to, to see you all. I have to say that the um, new uh, Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, as they call him, Leo Varadkar, will be delighted to see you all here. He said in his election campaign for the leadership that he wanted to represent people who got up early in the morning. So, uh, <laughs> so well, well done, well done all. Right, um, to business. Um, right, uh, the, there's no doubt in my, in my mind, my view, that uh, uh, Lenin is the greatest revolutionary. Uh, he, he was the greatest theoretician after Marx, Right. And by a good head, the greatest revolutionary practitioner, the greatest revolutionary leader that uh, we have yet seen. Um, but my book is not about that. All right? It's not about that because it's been said very eloquently by other people. Uh, Luca, George Lukács, in his book on uh, Lenin, a study, and the unity of his thought, which was written in 1924, just after Lenin died, says there, rightly in my opinion, that uh, Lenin was the only theoretician equal to Marx yet produced by the movement for uh, proletarian emancipation. Uh, Trotsky, writing about Lenin, compared Lenin to Marx and said Marx, when the end of the day, was the author of the Communist Manifesto and Capital, you put everything else aside, Lenin was the author of the Russian Revolution. Obviously, these are, this is when you reduce something to one sentence, but he was trying to say how great he thought Lenin was. And Tony Cliff, in his great four-volume biography, particularly volume one on building the party, says that there Lenin raised the unity of theory and practice to a higher level uh, than anyone else. I agree with all that. That's all been said. That's not why I, I wrote the book. Um, when my partner Mary and I were walking through Athens in passing, we saw graffiti, and the book starts with this. We saw some gra graffiti on the wall. It said, um, fuck May 68, fight today, fight now. And May 68 was very important to me. It was when I became a revolutionary and so on. I was in Paris in May 68. It was the last thing. But I, nonetheless, it was in the spirit of that that I wrote the book. The book is about, de deliberately, about the relevance of Lenin today. That's, that's what, and it's, make, it's an argument. It's not a biography. It's not an ac uh, account of everything Lenin said or did. It doesn't even attempt to be. It is an argument that the core propositions of Lenin are necessary for uh, 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 us today. So, uh, the, for that reason, the book does not start with Lenin, either in 1893 or 1917. The book starts uh, with the world today. It starts with an argument about why we need, as never before, a revolution. We need an international revolution. And uh, I won't go into that much because I want to concentrate on the Lenin aspect of it today. I won't go into that much. But the, uh, the arguments for this are straightforward and I think overwhelming. Even though they're not widely accepted, they are that we live in an increasingly impossible world for people. A world of soaring inequality that is producing mass anger. Uh, a, a world of increasing uh, international uh, and military instability, which threatens in barbaric wars, a, war, a world that is increasingly displacing people, producing a refugee crisis on a scale humanity has never seen before, and a world which is unsustainable uh, uh, environmentally because of uh, climate change and numerous other environmental uh, crises. If we do not resolve th 
this problem, uh, and I believe that only revolution can resolve that problem. If we do not resolve this problem in the foreseeable future, I mean, you can't by nature put dates on these things, but if we don't resolve it in the next generation or so, the question of socialism or barbarism will be posed more starkly than it ever has been before, more immediately, in, in, uh, in my view. Perhaps I'll come back to this at the end. So we need revolution, and once you talk about needing global revolution, then we are talking necessarily about international workers' revolution. The only force on this planet which can <coughs> defeat and overthrow the forces of the giant corporations that rule the world and the states which are allied to them, the power of US imperialism and the numerous other uh, uh, powerful states here in the world, all armed to the teeth and backed by the immense wealth of global capitalism. The only force that can do that is the uh, international working class. Uh, a class that now exists in its hundreds and thousands of millions from uh, uh, you know, Santiago and Sao Paulo to, uh, above all, uh, to uh, Shanghai, Canton, Guangdong, China, and so on, uh, and, and all places uh, uh, in between. That is the social force that has the potential to defeat uh, the enemy we're talking about. So that's, the, that's where the book starts, and that's the argument, and then the argument is that Lenin uh, makes decisive contributions towards that. Now, um, the, uh, I should say, it's worth saying in this context uh, what that means. Um, it is, in a way, against the stream. Right? The stream at the moment, a very welcome stream, very important stream, uh, is towards left reformism. The brilliant Corbyn phenomenon. The phenomenon of Sanders in America. The phenomenon of uh, Podemos in Spain. An international ph uh, phenomenon, which, you know, uh, we as revolutionaries uh, should be absolutely uh, enthusiastic about and relating to, I'll come back to that point uh, uh, later. But the argument of the book is that we need to go beyond that. That is not in itself I enough. Uh, all right. Look in one, one line, look what happened to Syriza I I in Greece. Much more to be said on that and I'll come back to it. But the argument is that we need to, to go beyond that and it is Lenin, in certain important respects, who holds the key to going beyond that, because Lenin was committed to international working class revolution from beginning to end. It's very striking when you read uh, Lenin, by the way, how whenever he makes a statement of any significance, it is always linked to the fate of the Russian Revolution to the International Revolution. When he arrives at the Finland station and makes his a speech, he arrives at the Finland station in, in April 1917. He talks about what's happening in Russia, but he ends with, long live the International Socialist Revolution. And that's every, every speech that Lenin made that was of importance to the masses or to the party comrades or whatever has the International Revolution. The International Workers' Revolution is absolutely at the center uh, of everything he did. Right. But of course, the International Workers' Revolution was Marx before it was Lenin and was the common currency of uh, Marx, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, and so on. What did Lenin add specifically that is crucial? Three things I want to emphasize here, and those three things I think define Leninism. They are, uh, and are crucial for L Leninism today. They are uh, uh, his theory of imperialism and war. His theory of the state, as embodied in his great work, State and Revolution, uh, and his theory and practice of building the Revolutionary Party. Those three things, I think, are, are, are the core. All right. First of all, imperialism and war. It was Lenin's theory of imperialism, developed in order to understand the First World War, primarily, that was his argument, was the underpinning that they were living then in a period when international revolution was on the agenda. It was an epoch of wars and revolutions. Imperialism was leading to devastating global war and to lots of uh, uh, 
national revolutionary movements, na movements of national liberation against imperialism, and that these were, were coming together. The global war was producing a crisis of the system that was making revolution uh, uh, a possibility. That was uh, his uh, uh, argument then. All right. Now, there is a long economic debate about the exact nature of imperialism and so on, to, to which Rosa Luxemburg contributed, Bukharin contributed before that, Hilferding, uh, and so on. I'm not going to go into that now. That's a meeting of it uh, 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 on its own and so on. But the politics of it, uh, the, the key, uh, and the key for us now. Of course, the world economic system has changed dramatically since then, in all sorts of ways. Again, that's a whole meeting. A brilliant article, by the way, uh, by uh, Chris Harmon called Analyzing Imperialism, and a book by Alex Kalinikos, Imperialism and Global Political Economy, goes into, it, in, into, all, uh, into all of that. But when all is said and done, certain things remain, <coughs> right? And they are clearly the case. That we have a world economy, a world system, as never before. That we have the domination of that world economy by giant corporations, uh, 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 as never before, and by great uh, imperial state powers that are linked to those uh, corporations and are, are part, part of this. A couple of arguments are, are very important here um, in, in this. The first uh, is there was an argument, particularly by the globalizers, that, uh, and sometimes on the left by Hart and Negri and so on, that uh, this was a global economic system that was somehow detached from states, that state power didn't matter in this, uh, right? That the notion of the, Lenin her, had argued of the relationship between imperialism and the state no longer applied. This was dis, disembodied, had no national territories and so on. I, I, Lenin was right then, and it, it's true, true today. This argument is wrong. It is not the case that the giant corporations don't need the state and are not related to the state. Actually, you think about it, if they open a supermarket, they need the state because otherwise the poor would come and loot the supermarket. You know, they wouldn't exist for, for a day without the state power, and they certainly wouldn't be able to operate on a world scale in the Middle East and everywhere else uh, uh, without it. So that's one argument, and Lenin is right on this. The second uh, argument that has existed is there's now only one imperial power. Since the collapse, of the Soviet Union and so on. The argument has been that there, there is now one global, global superpower, America, and everybody else is uh, not imperialist and so on. Again, this is, I want to say, factually wrong. Lenin's view of imperialism as a struggle between competing imperial powers is still uh, uh, relevant. Uh, I, I would argue that uh, Russia, Putin's Russia, is an imperialist power. China is an imperialist power and will become more so. And there are also an important role because of the weakening of America's global uh, power, not its strengthening. There will be increasingly important role played by various sub-imperial powers, uh, you know, like Saudi Arabia and Turkey. So they've now got more room for freedom of manoeuvre. Uh, than they used to at the height of the Cold War, uh, 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 and so on. What does this mean? This means that imperialist conflict, military conflict, is likely to increase. Uh, we see this all the time in the catastrophe of the Middle East, but we will see it, uh, I think, increasingly in the next decade or so, uh, and the American strategists think the same, uh, in the South China Sea as, as, as China becomes stronger and asserts itself more uh, militarily and so on. And that, of course, would be on a scale much greater than anything we've experienced. So consequently, the core of Lenin's arguments still apply in terms of our need to fight imperialism, fight imperialist war, oppose our own imperialism first uh, 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 and foremost, and to, to prepare for revolutions to, uh, to, to uh, uh, overthrow. Lenin was also 
uh, profoundly correct in his understanding of the need to support national liberation movements. Uh, and you see this is incredibly important in innumerable places around the world. Uh, in most obviously, the most obvious example would be Palestine. But Lenin's analysis of the right of nations to self-determination provides a guide, not a copybook because circumstances change, but nonetheless a guide, a starting point for understanding the question of Scottish independence, for understanding the question of Irish unity, for understanding the Catalan question, the Basque, and numerous different parts uh, of the world uh, uh, where that applies. Okay, next point, most important, the question of the state. Uh, when Lenin broke with social democracy, which was over the war, because the, m the majority, the large majority of international social democracy, and until 1914 Lenin thought of himself as a social democrat, as did Rosa Luxemburg and so on, uh, when they broke over the question of the war, because international social democracy support, supported the First World War, supported the imperialist slaughter, supported their own governments in that slaughter, Lenin pretty soon noticed a fundamental difference between them, even the sort of orthodox Marxists within uh, German and international social democracy like Karl Kautsky, a difference between them and Marx on the question of the state that people hadn't noticed before in the preceding period. The, if you were to read Karl Kautsky on the question of, uh, of the state and the other people who constituted the so-called orthodox Marxist center, they accepted uh, Marx's idea that the state, the present capitalist state, that the state was a capitalist state, it wasn't neutral, it defended and supported capitalist interests, that that state would have to be overthrown uh, that you would need to make a transition to a worker state and so on. But what they believed was that it was possible to capture this state, in particular through winning a parliamentary majority, but also maybe through a revolution, uh, and then take over that state and use it to construct socialism. Lenin said, this is not what Marx said, you look carefully, you'll see that from the time of the Paris Commune onwards, he added a footnote to the, com uh, to the Communist Manifesto and so on, that said precisely the opposite. You cannot just take over the existing state uh, operation. The working class cannot use the existing capitalist state to create a new order. And this became the core point of his book, State and Revolution, which was written, the notes for it was written in uh, uh, in 1916, and then the book itself was produced under extraordinary circumstances while he was in hiding uh, from the uh, counter-revolution uh, in Russia just before the insurrection, and then he breaks off and says, I'm sorry, I can't finish the book because I've got to, got to do, the, do this uprising, you know, and that's good. Yeah, it's an extraordinary book. But in this, he goes through uh, uh, everything that Marx and Engels said about the state and shows that this is their central argument. And uh, the question then applies, does this apply today? Uh, and I, will, I argue in the book that it does apply today. And that you see it above all, actually, not if you discuss it just uh, abstractly, it's true, abstractly in general, but you pose it concretely and it becomes very, very clear. Are you actually going to be able to take over MI6 and transform it? You'll point a socialist head of MI6 <laughs> and, he, uh, and he or she, probably a she these days, it would look more effective if it was a woman, uh, but a, so, a woman socialist, hey, but Diane Abbott, head of MI6. <laughs> right. uh, she probably would be nominally as Home Secretary, and then MI6 will turn into uh, an instrument for workers' emancipation. You know, you, you uh, point, um, Bernie Sanders wins the American presidential election, and he appoints a series of, I don't know, I can't think of the American equivalent of that, <laughs> Diane Abbott off the top of my head, but, you know, to be the head of the NYPD or the LAPD. And then they stop killing black people on the streets and start helping the workers picket lines. No, it doesn't, it does not work like that. What they will do, of course, is conspire against Diane Abbott or the American uh, uh, equivalents and so on. You cannot take over their state. You're not going to be able to take over the Pentagon and turn it into uh, a, a revolutionary army liberating. You're not going to take over the British army, 300 years of serving British imperialism around the world to 
you know, the <laughs> on the empire on which the sun never set and so on, and the blood never dried, and turn them into a force of... This practically, concretely cannot be done. On the contrary, those people will try and destroy any progressive socialist government, never mind a revolutionary socialist uh, uh, government. And so, on. so the question of smashing the state and replacing it with workers' power, popular power, organised from below, from the workplaces and the communities and so on, is uh, of crucial relevance uh, uh, today. Now that means, if this has an implication, it means again, and I repeat it, that much as we welcome and want to relate to the Corbyn phenomenon, much as it's wonderful that everybody sings, oh, Jeremy Corbyn at Glastonbury and so on, and it's fantastic and it's transformative. I'm not being sectarian about this, but it does mean our goal is to go beyond that. Uh, 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 right. Um, the third... Um, oh, no, I should say, I'm sorry, I was in danger of talking too long on these things. I should say that I discuss in the book a series of criticisms alternative positions to, to uh, Lenin's view uh, on this. I just got about five, but I'll mention two here because they're influential. One is the Foucault cri critique, because you encounter this all over the place. The Foucault critique says the problem with Marxism and Leninism is that it thinks that power is concentrated in the state, and we are more sophisticated than that. We understand that power exists everywhere. Right? It exists in the office, in the school. The teacher has power over the school kids. The head teacher has power over the teachers. It exists in the hospital. The consultants have power. It exists, your office manager has power over. It's everywhere in the society. It can't be just located in the, uh, uh, in the state. And therefore, what we need is a series of guerrilla struggles against all these powers and, and so on. I'll say uh, two, two things about this. Uh, first, at a, at a practical level and then at a deeper philosophical level. At a practical level, of course it's true. Teachers, head teachers, uh, consultants, office managers have bits of power, oh God, uh, have bits of power uh, 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 and so on. Uh, I'm not going to make that, I'm sorry, no chance. <laughs> I tell you, they have, bits of, they have bits of power. But, right, uh, but in a revolution, you see that's all true, in a revolution, a coup d'etat, the Egyptian coup d'etat that crushed the Egyptian revolution was led by General al-Sisi, by state power, not by office managers or doctors in the hospitals. I'm not saying they don't have power, but in a revolution, what counts is state power. And that's what Lenin is talking about, and that's what we're talking about, a revolution. So state power is concentrated on an incredible scale. You can't destroy the working class movement by, with, with a, a series of, uh, of dawn raids by consultants, <laughs> you know, you, you need armed bodies of men, so Lenin is right at that level, Foucault is also right, Foucault's roots lie in Nietzsche and the argument that everything, everything in history is all about the will to power, of every individual is just motivated by, this is a, this is a major alternative, but it's to, to Marxism, it can be made to sound left-wing when you're defending yourself against the will to power uh, 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 of your office manager, but actually if everything is just motivated by the will to power, this is a power struggle forever. We never resolve this. You never actually really make any progress at all, and you certainly can't achieve a socialist society, a society uh, based on real democracy, workers' freedom, uh, equality, and so on, because there's just the power struggle will, will go on, and you'll get Stalinism, and you'll get, and so on. So it actually has quite reactionary roots. It's presented as a left-wing argument in the universities and so on, but it has reactionary philosophical roots. The second critique I should say something about uh, is that uh, of Poulancis, right? It's usually focused on Nikos Poulancis, the Greek-French political theorist who wrote enormously complicated and sophisticated books on the state, which you're welcome to try and read if you, <laughs> if you want to. But actually, at the end of the day, I go through it in some detail in the book, but at the end of the day, what it says is, the state is not a thing, it's not an instrument, it's a condensation of class forces. This is true, actually. An atom bomb is a concentration of class forces, as, uh, 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 as it happens. But what he draws from this is the idea that because it's a condensation of class forces, you wage the class struggle within the state and you capture it and you transform it. 
In essence, because I'm conscious of the time, Polanthus is back to Karl Kautsky with fancy Althusserian language that makes you think it's an advance. But in reality, it's not. And you could see that in practice. Polanthus was the main Marxist theorist who inspired Syriza. What did Syriza do? Actually, they tried to run a capitalist state and a capitalist government in the same way as ordinary social democracy. They had different rhetoric, but they did the same, and it had the same conclusion. Uh, they capitulated, uh, uh, and, and so on. So it's an argument against those. The last, third element is the question of the, uh, the Revolutionary Party. Uh, 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 the Lenin was always in favour of a, a, a revolutionary party. To use it to its essence, uh, right, which I'm having to do all the time because of the time, um, there are three main strands in Lenin's argument about the revolutionary party. The first is that there needs to exist a revolutionary party. What do we mean by a revolutionary party? No mystery here, a party which is committed to socialist revolution, uh, you know, and which is open about this and it's its main aim and its uh, declared aim, and this is accepted and understood by the leadership and the majority, overwhelming majority of its members and so on. It wants a workers' revolution. Okay. Uh, uh, and this should exist politically independently. doesn't mean it doesn't form alliances and relate to, but it has political independence uh, from uh, uh, other forces. Now, that sounds elementary, but it was a fundamental difference between Lenin's Bolshevik Party and international social democracy. International social democracy, above all German social democracy, which was seen as the model until 1914, was always an alliance and a confused alliance between revolutionaries and reformists. And that was true everywhere else. It was true in Italy or wherever you were. In Germany, it meant you had Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, your revolutionaries, Karl Kautsky, a centrist in the middle, wobbling, and a right wing. Edward Bernstein, from a theoretical point of view, but leaders uh, like uh, uh, Ebert, Scheidemann, and Noska uh, as a reformist right wing, the Blairites uh, of their day, who, when the German Revolution broke out, were complicit in the murder of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and the suppression of them. They were all allied. They were all part of the same party. There was no clear differentiation. What differentiated the Bolsheviks, they were not. They were a, a, a revolutionary uh, party. As I say, the same thing existed in... Uh, 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 other countries. So that's a, the first uh, principle on that, and it was carried through in the Communist International and so on. Uh, the second principle was that, as, and it's a necessary complement to the first, because the first can just give you an isolated sect. The second principle is that you have this party, this revolutionary party, has to engage with and relate to all the day-to-day -day struggles of the working class. It has to build real roots in, in the class, fighting over everything that affects uh, uh, the class. The Bolshevik party was built first and foremost to agitation in the factories, right? But then it took up issues like social insurance. It has to be in the unions, but it also has to be in parliament if it can be. They fought, Lenin fought bitterly to, to they, they should contest elections to the Tsarist Duma. The Tsarist Duma wasn't even a democratic parliament. He said, we've got to use this because we've got to speak to people. You used everything you can to relate to uh, uh, the actual workers' struggle. When uh, uh, Zubatov set up police trade unions and so on, they tried to relate to the workers in the police unions. You work in reactionary trade unions. You work in communities. You work wherever you can to relate to the actual uh, 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 work, uh, working class. And that is the dialectical complement to the uh, in existence and independence of a, a, a revolutionary party. You can't, you can't have one without the other. You just end up uh, uh, with a sect. And the third point, again, of great relevance today, and this was elaborated in what is to be done, and usually missed in the, everybody concentrating what is to be done was Lenin and an elitist and so on on the basis of one sense. The main point about what is to be done is that to be a revolutionary, you have to be a tribune of the people who fights all oppression. Lenin gives the examples that apply crucially in Tsarist Russia. You have to defend, he says, religious minorities, for example. Interesting point. But the Bolsheviks did. They defended, uh, the Muslims, they defended Christian sects who are being uh, 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 oppressed and, and so on. You have to fight all the, the struggles of the, uh, the oppressed. Women, uh, anti-Semitism, big uh, issue. If anybody, you want to see what the hell they did that, that you can Google Lenin on anti-Semitism. There is a speech, it's three minutes. 
It is a model, an absolute model. How in three minutes you explain to the Russian masses why you have to fight anti-Semitism uh, 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 and so on. Now, just on, uh, on this. So Lenin was saying this in 1901. Right, because there's a tendency to say this is, we only learnt this in the 60s or the 70s or something, uh, etc. No, Lenin was saying this in 1901. And if you take ideas like intersectionality and privilege theory and so on, Lenin has everything that is progressive in all that. He has it <laughs> or, or, already. He understands this, the, but he goes beyond that and he goes beyond it in an important way because he says you're fighting all these oppressions, but you're fighting these oppressions from the standpoint of the working class. Right? To unite all the oppressed in an alliance which is led by the working class. Not led in authoritarian. The working class leads the struggle in practice to defend all the oppressed, especially in the case of Russia, the oppressed nationalities. It is a matter of honour and pride if you're a socialist that you're in the forefront uh, 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 of all, all those struggles for women's rights, etc., etc. Now, when we bring this forward to today, of course circumstances have changed. You cannot look up in, in Lenin. The Bolsheviks were progressive on this. They um, decriminalised homosexuality and so on. But you cannot look up in Lenin and find much that is uh, useful to, uh, you know, the, the struggle for trans rights, LGBT, and so on. You should read Laura Miles for that <laughs> there at, the, uh, at the back and so on. So it needs to be updated. The struggle against racism and so on, this is written before the civil rights movement, before uh, the struggle against apartheid and so on. But the core approach that you, the workers' movement has to challenge all oppression, but it does so from the point of view of establishing an alliance with the, led by the working class, seems to me to, to be valid. And right, oh good, <laughs> that's not too bad. Right, so all of that. Now, uh, um, all of these ideas, I, I argue, are really, really useful for revolutionary practice today. More than useful, essential for revolutionary practice today. Without them, uh, yeah, you don't have serious revolutionary practice. The idea that I think is the most challenging and the most difficult for us at the present time is the question, and I, I think this is true internationally, uh, is the question of relating all this uh, to the, the working class movement. We, we can all see that you had, to, to our surprise, to all our surprise, very pleasant surprises, uh, we saw the phenomenon of Sanders in America, right, coming, uh, not supposed to be possible, but suddenly you have someone who's an avowed socialist challenging for the leadership of the Democratic Party. They predictably stop him and go with Clinton instead. But nonetheless, a mass movement developing around this, mass rallies and so on. And you see that coming on the back of great struggles like Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock and the Occupy movement be before that. You see <coughs> um, big struggles in the Arab Spring. You see the Occupy movement coming out of that, Podemos and so on. But in all of these, let's be honest, and I could give many other examples, it's true in Britain too, with the Corbyn phenomenon and so on. In all of these, the Leninist ideas I've been talking to, uh, they may sound common sense to you, I don't know, I hope they do, but all of those ideas are marginal in, in, many, in many countries. Most countries, they're marginal. They're, they're you know, not regarded as the zeitgeist of the current movement, which is much more, you know, broad alliances, uh, intersectionality, all of those kind of different uh, approaches. And this is something that we have to, I think, think very seriously about how we address. If it is true that the clock is ticking, if it is true that we are going to face the challenge of socialism or barbarism in, in a very, very real way, because climate change will produce enormously more refugees. If you have an enormously more refugees, how are you going to respond to them? Are you going to respond to them like Marine Le Pen, or are you going to respond to them in a socialist way and so on? This, this is, if we face more wars and more terrorist attacks and so on, these questions will become very real. And more anger in the world at the inequality and austerity and so on, who's going to articulate? These are very, very real questions. Therefore, we have to talk, I think, seriously about how Leninism can be made real, a real force uh, 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 in, the, uh, uh, in the world today. And uh, I think it means, and I think we can learn from Lenin here, uh, it means 
several things. I think, first, first of all, it means we have to engage much more in popular agitation in working class communities. Second thing I think is very, very important uh, in this, I think social media has become very important. I think our movement has been slow about this. I learned about social media first, I remember, in the Egyptian revolution, when I talked to Mahi Anur al-Masri, people may know the Egyptian revolutionary woman, about how they, she said, we took down the, uh, um, the police headquarters torture center in Alexandria. I said, how did you do it? She said, we did it on Facebook. Now, and then, it, 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 you know, we put out a call on Facebook and everybody turned up. I said, what? This is too, I had no idea about that. You know, I'd have thought you gave out a leaflet. But that's how they did it. And I thought, well, you, you need to learn something here. You're missing a trick here. This is, you know, I know you go on Facebook and there's people talking about their cats and their breakfasts and good luck to them. But I thought, no, 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 this, this is, you've got, you've got to uh, learn something about that. Uh, and then I saw in Ireland in the water charges movement, the water charges movement was in part, not only, organised on Facebook in working class communities. Networks of working class people organised to resist the meters being put in front of their houses on Facebook. Now, uh, and in the Corbyn election campaign, you saw great use made by that campaign of Facebook, of videos, of memes and so on, which created an alternative space to the space uh, uh, dominated by the vile and horrible media abuse that Corbyn was uh, uh, suggesting. Now, I do not, I haven't become converted to Paul Merce, Mason and the idea that in the beginning is social media. That's the core. No, 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 no. No, no, please don't. I hope nobody would caricature that and explain to me that it's class forces and mass struggle. Of course I understand that. But that's not a reason for using, not using a tool. You know, uh, Lenin understood, uh, to go back to the example, that it was class struggle that produced the Russian Revolution. It didn't mean he wasn't in favour of using cinema, and, you know, as a, a weapon to, of propaganda uh, 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 and so on. So I think that we need to up our game. And, and all of us need to learn how to use it. You know, we, I don't think... You know, just as back in the day I learned how to work a gestetner, I was going to say I was taught by Cliff, not literally, but you know, he made the point. I believe you have to know how to use a Gestetner, comrade. You know, <laughs> and all that ink, that talking about and so on, and give out leaflets at the factory. Revolutionaries have to learn how to use social media for uh, 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 those purposes. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna wind up. Um, like, there's a load more to say uh, 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 about this, but we have to find. And this needs to be. I haven't got time for it. I think to be a Leninist today, we have to have a serious discussion about how, if you were in America, you could relate to the Sanders phenomenon, how we can relate to the Corbyn phenomenon here. Because, I repeat, and I make no apologies for repeating, the clock is ticking. We do not have another hundred years. We don't have another... I've been in the movement nearly, nearly 50 years. We do not have another 50 years before we're going to face really decisive... Uh, struggles. We have to, in my opinion, we have to build to make Leninism a force to, to win the revolution. You can come from fourth or fifth place, and the Russian Revolution shows this, to first place in the space of months of revolution, right? as happened uh, in, in between February and October. But you have to be at the races. Right? In Germany, in the 1930s, the Trotskyists were not at the races. There was a hundred of them in Germany. Trotsky could write and did write the most magnificent analysis of fascism or what it was, but they couldn't influence events. We've got, to, we've got to get to be at the races, and then we have a chance of the prize, which is uh, uh, October. That's the aim of the book. Okay. <laughs> So I had the privilege of reading John's book uh, slightly before publications and I really want to take the opportunity to encourage comrades to buy it, to read it and also to encourage younger and newer socialists within the movement, in the Labour Party or to, to the SWP to, uh, to, to examine the book because I think what John does incredibly well in the, uh, in, in the book is to explain how Lenin could be an extraordinary revolutionary leader precisely because his practice and politics were rooted in a detailed understanding of Marxism. And he puts across really how 
uh, Lenin was able to develop and uh, expand Marxism, to take Marxism and Engels' original writings and to uh, not use them as a dogmatic set of quotes which he endlessly repeated, but to apply them to a living, breathing, changing, uh, changing situation. And that comes across brilliantly in the book. And I think it's a lesson that we can learn today. You can't, for instance, write about imperialism or national liberation struggles or, or, or revolution in the 21st century without actually looking back to what Lenin said, what Lenin did, what Lenin wrote, when he was right and, and when, when he was wrong. And I think that comes across well in the book. And the other thing I think John does excellently in the, in the book is to examine Lenin's practice as a revolutionary. You see, I'm, I was struck rereading the stuff about 1917 for the centenary and, 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 and in John's, uh, John's chapter on it, the way that Lenin was able, with the Bolsheviks, to transform the political situation when he arrives back in Russia in 19, uh, April 1917. He does so not because he's got a, a great, brilliant ability to speak to people or he's just got a great analysis of the situation. He does it because he's relating to an, a, a, a mass organisation of workers who are engaged in revolutionary struggle. So Lenin's ability to understand what's going on is linked very closely to his, uh, uh, his, his links with the, uh, with the movement. He learns from the workers and he teaches the, uh, the workers and thus he's able to lead them and to transform the, uh, uh, the Bolshevik party. These are all crucial lessons for us when we try to build a revolutionary party in the 21st century. Understanding and relating to that mass movement, those hundreds of thousands of people who are voting for Corbyn and talking about, about socialist, uh, socialist ideas, what we can do is to say to them, not in a patronising way, you've come so far, Let's, let's go further, further together. That's precisely, I think, what, what Lenin does in, uh, in 1917. So I really want to, to encourage, buy it, read it, sell it sort of thing with this, uh, with this, with this book. It's a book for, for the 21st century. It's a book for a, a new movement of socialists who are starting to grapple and understand the ideas that John talked about, about the state, about capitalism, about how it works, how it operates, about the challenges that will face the, uh, the movement. We've got a lot to learn. We've also got a lot to teach. Uh, thanks. Um, John talked about Polanski's definition of, the, of um, the state and the concentration of classes. Actually, what Lenin talked about was the state being an expression of the irreconcilability of classes. In other words, it is there to defend one class against the other. And when we talk about a revolutionary party, a revolutionary party is there to fight for the working class against the ruling class. And therefore, it's not a broad church. The party is not a broad church. There is a sense in which we want to be a broad church. We want to be young, old, gay, straight, trans, non-binary, men, women, black, white, young, old, teachers, public, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Every section of the working class involved in it. We need to be much better at that. We need to go out and fight for that. But actually, we need to, on politics, we are not a broad church. We are, we are quite self-consciously fighting for the working class. And that means a number of things. It means standing unconditionally with the oppressed. Maybe sometimes questioning, but actually unconditionally on the side of the Palestinians. Unconditionally on the side of Muslims being attacked on their way um, home from mosques and, uh, 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 and so on. Unconditionally with everybody who now wants to seize the time, smash the pay freeze, bring down this rotten government. We're not questioning the politics of the people that we go and stand on the picket lines and demonstrations with. We're with them and we're fighting alongside them, but we're doing it to build a party and an organisation that will fight for the ideas of socialist revolution and the working class within that. And one of the ways in which we do that, actually, I think John is absolutely right that we all need to be much, much better at using social media and we can all learn from that. But what do people say about Socialist Workers' Party? Oh, we see you everywhere. You're always there selling your papers. You're on every picket line. You're on every demonstration. I'm going to go to be going to Pride later. I'm not going to be there to dance and have a party. I'm going to be there selling Socialist Worker. Pride should be a protest. It should be about fighting back. Fuck the commercialisation of pride that we all hate. This is why I'm going to be going down there. And one of the things that we need, and, and, and that is an argument needs to be organised, and the paper brings together all the different strands of it for people. And I, I'm, I'm not taking away from what John said about social media, but don't, you know, we do need to make, we need more people out there helping us with that task. You all have something to offer us in terms of us learning how to fight the class struggle better. We have something to offer you in terms of making your fight for socialism more effective. And therefore, if you're not in the Socialist Workers' Party, the main lesson of what John is saying is, please join. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Tom Kay. I'm a member of Haringey SWP and uh, the editorial board of Socialist Review. Um, 
One of the things that Lenin uh, was absolutely insistent on throughout all of his writings, building on uh, the writings of Marx uh, and, uh, and, others uh, and, and others, was the absolute centrality of fighting for uh, the dictatorship, uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat, as it was called. Now, I think for a lot of people coming into politics today, um, the word dictatorship, rightly, uh, has very negative connotations, connotations of Stalinism, uh, of the horrors that we've seen across... Uh, Af 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 Africa, Africa, Africa and, and, and elsewhere. And I suppose what I wanted to do really was to try and explain to people what it meant because dictatorship at the time had a very different meaning. Um, really, Marx, Lenin and so on saw the dictatorship of the proletariat as being the leadership of working class people in responding to the crises of capitalism and an absolute insistence on that leadership uh, being the basis to which revolutionaries should turn. And the truth is we see this, we see this today. Um, out of the crises of capitalism, of the British state, uh, look at Grenfell, uh, a horror, uh, clearly, but I think one of the most inspirational things about Grenfell was the sight of thousands of working class people from around the country and from around London flooding into Kensington and responding to the horrors caused by our government. We should be clear, who is dealing with the crisis in Grenfell? It isn't Sir Martin Moore Bick or whatever his name is. It isn't Theresa May. It's ordinary people. When capitalism goes into crisis, ordinary people are, respond, uh, are forced to respond by the fact that if we don't, uh, we, we have to, we, we are forced to, uh, to that, to, you know, to, uh, 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 to that, to that, to that, to die and so on. And, you know, I think ordinary people are clearly trying to respond to the crisis that exists on a general level in society at the moment. I think you see that a little bit with the response to Corbyn's manifesto and to Corbynism. People recognising that that manifesto offers some real solutions for people in t uh, 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 um, uh, 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 at the moment. Or you think about the, the resonance of Corbyn's call to requisition homes in response to Grenfell for, 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 for ordinary people. Um, but the question for us, right, and the question for members of the Socialist Workers' Party isn't just about how you shape a debate rhetorically within the Houses of Parliament, but it's about how we turn those questions into practical solutions of, 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 of working class people about using the question of, of politics and the state, is that two minutes or yeah, three minutes? Please. Two, okay. Of politics uh, 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 and the state to shape, to give confidence to, to reinforce, to deepen the movement of ordinary working, uh, working, working class people against the horrors of capitalism. So I think the questions for us today, Leninism today, is about how do we build a housing movement which has the confidence and the strength to requisition homes, to squat in response to the housing crisis that exists in London? How do workers break the pay freeze uh, in a way which isn't just about 2%, which is about smashing the idea that we have below inflation pay rises and how the people across the fast food industry not just get uh, £10 an hour in 2020 if Corbyn wins but get £10 an hour today. How do we respond to the rise of the far right and continue to undermine the attempts of the political centre to whip up racism and really they're the questions that the Socialist Workers Party and Marxism Festival we want to try and resolve. You know Corbyn and this is where I'm finishing, raised the slogan for the many uh, not the few. I think we have to think about a different mantra, which is about saying by the many and against the few at the top of society who refuse to give us an inch. Um, hi, I actually have a question. Um, I really agreed with everything John had to say. Um, I've been a revolutionary socialist for about 20 years now, I joined a Leninist organization in the, in the US, um, the, the International Socialist Organization, uh, <laughs> quite a long time ago. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I've been one for many, many years, um, theoretically, to, to Leninism and the need for revolutionary party. Um, but I feel like in the last couple of years, I've had some doubts about the possibility for that. And I hope that the speaker and maybe others can speak to that. Um, because I think if you look at the timeline, I mean, over 20 years I've been a Leninist, but the, the Bolshevik party formed in, what, 1903, the Russian Revolution was in 1917, um, that, that's about 14 years. Um, a lot of the time, um, as a Leninist, there was a lot of talk about sort of the waxing and waning in terms of the membership of a revolutionary organization. Struggle goes up, you can expect hopefully membership to go up, struggle goes down. Uh, maybe expecting a membership to go down, but that throughout you've got a revolutionary party that can keep together 
uh, Marxist ideas um, and Leninist politics to eventually <laughs> help to lead the revolution. Um, but I feel like today, if, if we look at the, the far left, the revolutionary left, we have a lot of smaller organizations of people very, very like-minded, but who are in different organizations with smaller disagreements. I guess the question is, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm wondering what the SWP sees as the, um, <laughs> what it's gonna look like in terms of building a mass revolutionary independent party. What is that gonna look like in terms of different organizations coming together? Thank you. After this, comrade, uh, comrade uh, in the blue T-shirt towards the back, who put his hand up his neck? Oh, there you are, sorry. <laughs> Hi, just sort of following up on my speaker. Um, I uh, got the book, What Is To Be Done. It's like a little small book, isn't it? It's about a uh, second shop. I read it, and it's really interesting. But he was talking about 1903, I think it was. Sorry, uh, what Is To Be Done. All right, yeah. yeah. Um, and there was many on the left at the time with him, and... Uh, there's lots of discussion going between him, the Mensheviks, etc., about who should be a member of a party, uh, how they should fight for a revolution, etc. Uh, there were some people saying, well, it should be a broad church, and we shouldn't be having these huge um, polemical arguments over a minutiae. For instance, uh, I guess he was a bit accused of being a bit like uh, the medievalist scholastics when he used to argue how many angels you could get on the top of a pin. And they were saying, well, the bigger picture is the most important thing, not these like minutiae like that you're concentrating on, that Lenin was concentrating on. So basically what I want John to sort of say is that today many people on the left accuse uh, Lenin as of being anti-democratic, et cetera, et cetera. And the people who have said that Lenin's, Lenin's is absolutely was democratic. So if you could maybe clarify those issues when you come back to do the uh, end notes. Yeah. Thank you. Comrade, it'll be you, yeah, and then. Yeah, I, I noticed that John's book has a, a little two page postscript right at the end about Lenin's personality, and I just wanted to pick up on that because I was really glad to see that there. It's not the most important thing, but I think it needs to be in there. One of the lines of attack against Lenin is about his personality, as in they like to present him as a cold blooded, you know, ideologue and so on and so forth. And I think it is important that we you know, argue the Cliff Lenin, the political Lenin, and most of John's book, but actually that there, is, there is a human Lenin, which we shouldn't let them get away with stealing from us as well. And uh, Krupskaya's memories of Lenin, I think, is very useful for this. She tells this wonderful story where in, I think it was something like 1901, Lenin's in exile, and they're trying to build the Bolshevik organization, and this comrade comes and visits them, and he's young and he's very excited and he says, oh yeah, you know, we're really doing well in Saratov or wherever it is. And, you know, we've actually set up three or four committees, a committee for education, a committee for propaganda, a committee for finance. And Lenin says, this is wonderful. Who's, who's on the committee for education? And this government says, well, well, actually, that's just me. Uh, Who's on the committee for finance? Well, uh, that's just me, actually. You can see where it's going. Now, actually, Lenin fell off the chair laughing, according to Krupskaya. You know, he thought this was hilarious. He then obviously argued, you know, we can't go on like this, comrades. No bullshit and so on. But he thought it was funny. Uh, and then other stories, like Victor Serge tells you that after they'd seized power, Lenin in the Kremlin, he sees him one day sitting in the queue to get his hair cut by the hairdressers. He's not, you know, I'm Lenin in front of the queue, I want my hair cut, I'm trying to fight, you know. He actually takes his place in the queue. And actually loads of people who met Lenin, uh, you know, uh, people like Arthur Ransom and, and various other people like that, they, they, they nearly all say, I was pleasantly surprised at the lack of the ego of the man. Interestingly, one of the main exceptions to that is Stalin, who when he met Lenin for the first time said, I was so disappointed, I wanted a giant. I wanted, you know, an eagle of the movement. And, you know, that, that says something, doesn't it, about Stalin. My favourite story, just to finish, uh, is from the R Ronald Clark biography of Lenin, which I think is very good for this, which is uh, Lenin stayed up all night with two German comrades at the Communist International, drafting the uh, main document. And the German communist says in his memoirs, he says, you know, we were up all night and we were getting really tired and really struggling. And Lenin started actually to realize this and started to make us laugh and tell jokes. And then we finally finished it and the sun was coming up and we said, oh, you know, we've got to go to bed now. And Lenin said, but there's all the meetings now coming up in the day. He said, take my advice, comrades. What you do is you go home, you have a hot bath, then a cold shower, a spot of breakfast, go for a walk, and then you can get through the meetings all day.
And so we're not going to be able to get in everyone who's put their hands up, but I think just probably the next two will need to be the last two. Apologise to everyone else. Um, thank you. I just wanted to thank John for the sort of last point that he was making because those of us who do spend too much time maybe sometimes on social media perhaps find ourselves getting into debates with others who are from a slightly different tradition than our party who are quite critical of our approach to not supporting Assad because America is worse, for example, or um, our position that we've supported the Corbyn campaign but said you sort of support and vote for Corbyn but continue the fight and they've actually sort of been saying that the starting point should be to get rid of groups like the SWP because we're sort of intellectuals and bourgeois and get rid of the Labour Party because it's racist to its very core and, and that therefore you can start a revolution because it's the workers which actually is the same idea that we would have that the the fight has to come from the working class but actually this idea that you don't meet the class where it is and then give that sort of leadership and the arguments to take it forward towards revolutionary ideals actually is crippling and we have to be fighting for this idea that you take where the class is, you talk to them about the ideas that they already have and you see how you can push them towards the views that we would argue were necessary and important. So I wanted to thank John for that conclusion because it summed it up much better than I can, but thank you. Yeah, just a couple of quick points. I, I wanted to thank the comrade who's come up from America. I told you she's America, she mentioned the ISO. Uh, and, and I think in a way she raises a very, very key question. The key question, really, is how can revolutionaries in relatively very small organisations make an impact, and if you like to use John's analogy, be at the races? Because I think there is no comfort in thinking it's like Newtonian physics crisis equals growth of the revolutionary left, this will be automatic, this will just come to us, people will understand. And that is a form of, if you like, mechanical materialism, which Lenin, amongst many of us, fought very hard against. There isn't anything automatic about this. We are in a struggle. We are in a fight, in a debate, in an argument, which in which uh, the, the, uh, the, the left has to really get its act together. And I think one thing is a generality, if you are trying to build the left, revolutionary left, whether it's in America, Britain, or anywhere else, where you've seen this explosion in different ways of, if you like, radical left reformism, if you don't think that the key question is how you relate to this, and I don't mean Mr. Saunders as a person, I don't mean Jeremy Corbyn as a person, the people who look to these people, and in Britain this is millions. That's the scale of it. You see, even since the election... Labour has gone up, I don't know, is it 7% in the polls? Or 6, 6, 7, 8% in the polls. Think about it. That's probably about 5, 4, 5 million people have shifted in weeks. Now, how does the revolutionary left relate to those people? How do we start to get an audience? It seems to me, yes, it's about explanation. Yes, it's about a clarity of politics. You have to have the clarity on the question of the state. You have to have clarity about imperialism. But if you're just that, and I'm all for that, then actually there's a mismatch. We have to be able to articulate the anger, but articulate what needs to be done. And then what is needs to be done isn't just at the end smash the state, all for it. What is needs to be done tomorrow, the day after, the day after that? How do we break the pay cap? How do we smash that? How do we take on the housing crisis? How do we, do we take on austerity? How do we combat racism? How do we take on the far right? All of these questions, we have to articulate a very concrete set of demands. And I think we have to get back into that tradition. What do we do to move with large amounts of people? And I think we have to have a vision. When Lenin said in 1914, we're an epoch of wars and revolution. I suspect the following. People understood there were an epoch of wars because it was happening. They probably didn't think it was an epoch of revolution because there was none happening. He was right. We are now in an epoch, I believe, of wars and revolutions. It won't simply be a rerun of 1914, but the crisis inside society in the world global system is very deep. And the last thing is the global climate change disaster 
is of a magnitude which I now think is becoming apparent to millions and millions of people. And that is going to pose a question, socialism or barbarism. The barbarism may be war as it was in the past, it may be in the future, but it could be absolute catastrophe for the large amounts of humanity on this planet. And therefore we are in a race, we're in a race, and we have to relate to and have a vision of relating to large amounts of people. No longer can the revolutionary left be satisfied with talking to small amounts of people. We have to actually make a, break, make, a, make, a, make a break, and therefore what is to be done in that sense remains totally irrelevant today. Right, right I want to start with the, the question of the personal Lenin. Um, not really to call a great deal about the personal Lenin, but it is very closely connected, I think, to the question about Lenin, uh, the anti-democratic Lenin that you can read about endlessly uh, uh, in the media. This is the dominant view. First of all, people should know where this view came from. It is not the dominant view in the academic world and in the media representation of, of, of Lenin. The, the, new, the Lenin who seized power by a coup, all to gain power for the Bolsheviks and so on, and it was always a, a, a proto-dictatorship proto, uh, and led straight to Stalin. This didn't arrive uh, spontaneously in people's heads. This view was developed by American imperialism through the state intellectuals who work for the Pentagon and then influence and dominate uh, um, political science and so on in the United States with great resources behind it. They used many ex-Mensheviks, embittered Mensheviks to supply them with the quotes from Lenin that were supposedly proved the point, going back to the fact that it was all part of a master plan laid in what is to be done because Lenin said you had to introduce socialism into the working class from the outside. You see, you're going to force socialism on the working class and so on and so forth. Uh, so th this, th this is all connected. Um, uh, a book by Lars Lee demolishes, but, uh, uh, on what is to be done, demolishes all this at enormous length, if you heard. Uh, uh, and I, I, I tackle it in the book. But I just, I just want to say on this that um, I didn't, couldn't, in the, in the time available, talk about how uh, Stalinism emerged out of the revolution. There's a chapter in, in, in the book. It's a very important uh, question. I won't speak about that here. But one of the things that reading Lenin strikes you when you actually read what the events are is that from the beginning, from when he started factory agitation around the Thorntons factory in Petrograd, right through to the end, he had an organic relationship to the working class, a real, living, organic uh, uh, relationship. Quite different from Plekhanov, the founder of Russian Marxism, who couldn't actually relate to real flesh and blood workers. Not so. Uh, uh, Lenin, and uh, um, go this uh, this uh, uh, leads. I mean, I could go, go through at some length the, the formally the democratic character of the Bolshevik Party. Uh, you know, they had conferences, they had debates, they were always different factions and different points of view, and this existed right through the revolution, after the revolution. Lenin wasn't always in a majority. Sometimes he was outvoted, etc., etc. The, the idea was a dictation, but completely untrue. But something is more involved here, and that is how Lenin learned from the working class. You see, uh, um, uh, Martin Empson said, talked about, again, this dialectical r r relationship. On the one hand, you're using Marxism to inform the movement. On the other hand, you're also using the movement to inform Marxism. And Lenin is a master of this. And it, 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 there's a lot of people say, oh, we have to learn from the class. And then you go, well, what? What are you actually learning? But with Lenin, you can answer that question. For example, there's this wonderful passage where he's trying to analyze the July days uh, uh, in Russia. And he said, I was calculating the forces and so on. And then I was in hiding with the, in this uh, 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 worker's house and he put bread on, uh, on the table. And he said, ah, he said, they have to give us decent bread now. They can't give us rotten bread like they could before. And Lenin says, that's how the worker looked at it. And I learned from this because the workers' class instinct told them we haven't been defeated. We've still got them on the run. We can still go forward. It's very, very important. He was learning that from the class. He, Lenin learned about the Soviets and the role of the Soviets in 1905 from the workers. It wasn't, it's not in the books. Marx doesn't mention them. 
right? A lot of Bolsheviks, when the Soviets first emerged, said, oh, are they, who are these Soviets? Aren't they getting in the way of the party? Lenin said, no, we need the Soviets and the party. And he learned it from the Russian working class and so on. And in late 19... 17, in September and October, the leadership of the Bolshevik Party was reluctant about organizing an insurrection. What does Lenin say to them? He says, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. We don't do it now. Uh, the whole revolution can be ruined, etc. And he, he, he threatens them. He says, if you don't agree to do it, I am going to go to the sailors. And he won the argument. Just he won the argument for the April thesis, not because he was cleverer than Zinoviev and Karmov. He was, but that's not why he won the argument. He won the argument because what he was saying, he was learning it from and relating it to what the workers in the Weibor district and the sailors of Kronstadt were saying. What he was saying fitted with what they wanted to do. So that dialectical uh, uh, relationship is abso uh, uh, absolutely uh, crucial there. Now, like uh, Hugh Williams who spoke, I was uh, very struck uh, uh, by the, the, the question. Actually, before I come on to that, I want to just say about the anti-party mood. You know, there was, particularly in 2011, but it's still there, that we don't need parties, we don't need this, etc., etc. This sounds very left-wing, doesn't it? You know, we're going to have spontaneous revolution, we don't need parties. It's interesting that the moment here... Is that me? I, th I think it's the mic, it was doing it yesterday. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I have problems with You're the mic yesterday. One. The lifts don't work, the mics don't work, it'll be better under socialism. <laughs> right, the, the um, um, oh God, I lost where I was. Where I, was. I was the anti-party move. No, it's actually, anti-partyism is a form of a radical language covering reformism. What it really means is we want to fight lots of little battles about single issues. Good, I'm glad that people want to do that, but, that, but then it translates into then a mass reformist phenomenon. Like in Spain, it translated into Podemos, left reformism. In America, you know, the Occupy movement translates into Sanders uh, and so on. In, in Britain, it translates into Cor uh, Corbynism, etc. They, These people dislike revolutionary parties because they think they're small and irrelevant and get in the way. Okay. But it isn't really uh, uh, anti-partyism and the second bit of it we need to do something about. And that's where... Um, it, 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 the, I, th I thought the, the question from the American, am I right calling you the, I don't know your name, the American comrade. Uh, okay, it's very, very important. Actually, there's a discussion uh, of some length of this problem in the last chapter of my book. It is a fact, uh, and it's a fact we have to uh, address. Um, right, now, in part, fundamentally, this is an objective problem. Right, it is a problem that lies deep in the defeats that the working class movement suffered in the 1930s. We suffered two great world historic catastrophic defeats. One of those uh, was Hitler and fascism, which destroyed the most powerful workers movement in Europe and cast a shadow over the 1930s uh, completely, 1933. Tony Cliff used to call 19, uh, the Conquest, the victory of Hitler and the Nazis in Germany, he used to call it the October Revolution of the fascists of the right. And it, it was. So it was that huge de defeat. And a defeat like that does not radicalize people. It produced the support for the Popular Front and, uh, and so on. The, the other defeat, even worse in terms of long-term consequences, was the counter-revolution in Russia. Um, you know, sad Stalinism that gave us all such a bad name in the words of the uh, uh, um, ABC of Socialism, but which, again, has cast a historic shadow over the, the, the whole movement. And this drove authentic revolutionary socialism, the revolutionary ideas of Marx, uh, of Lenin, of Trotsky, and so on, to the margins. It's symbolized in the tragic figure of Trotsky, uh, you know, who went from addressing millions and leading millions to holes in the wall and addressing meetings of where this would be a mass meeting and so on, uh, 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 et cetera. And since then, the revolutionary movement internationally has been struggling to recover. We made serious uh, 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 strides in repressing after the fall uh, of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism, but that was widely seen 
by people as a defeat for the left as, uh, as well. So it was not a simple uh, uh, question. And uh, uh, the post-war boom made it, made it hard. So that, that all these are objective uh, factors. But there are also subjective factors involved. Because if you are, exist marginalized from the movement, Trotsky was always railing about this, the people you exist in that, you can get comfortable in that situation and you develop habits of just talking to each other and so on, not of addressing the people outside and so on. So it needs a, 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 consci a conscious res uh, uh, response to it. I stress the use of social media in this, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the present situation. I mean, our experience in Ireland is quite recent experience, but we have been able to make some effective use of social media. We produce an alternative TV. And it's very simple. It's actually just, you know, a couple of comrades who do a sort of rant on TV. <laughs> but, but we call it alternative TV, puts our point of view. And uh, some of them, you know, when we get the right issue that connects, get something like 70, 80,000 views. Now, I'm the, I understand the importance of the paper. I wrote for uh, God knows how many years the British Socialist Worker. I can't remember how many years it was. I wrote a regular column. And I edit the Irish Socialist Worker. But I tell you, uh, you know, we never had a sale in Ireland of 70,000 or 80,000. You know, you can reach people uh, in that sort of way. So we need to learn how to, to, to do it. Um, there's uh, another question here, which is language. You see, um, Tom spoke and explained at this meeting about what the dictatorship of the proletariat really meant and, and, and so on. Good, you can do that at a meeting of Marxism. You cannot do that at a street meeting to resist the water charges, or to resist, or to fight over Grenfell. You don't start with Lenin said about the dictatorship, what it meant was, no, no, you need, a, you need, now in, what we did in, in Ireland, you can see, you know, these things fit, you, I'm, not, they, they're I'm not saying do what we did in Ireland, because if you were in Turkey or in Egypt or you're in China, you have to find something that fits there. But what we talked about was people power. Right. People, but we need to fight this with people power. People power fitted what people understood. I know it's not quite as good as workers' power, but you can say we need people power and workers' power when it's appropriate. You can move from one to the other, but we talked about people power. Uh, uh, right, mobilization from below, and our goal is people power. We need a different kind of democracy, a democracy. That was a way of talking about those same issues in language that people understood. And in the Great Water Charges movement, people marched in their tens of thousands in the street chanting, Ender, that's Ender Kenny, our former prime, Ender in your ivory tower, this is called people power. So the, pop, the slogan was popular. It reached hundreds of thousands of people. Okay, now it's not as good as getting them to read State and Revolution, but it's a step in the right direction. And we produced a pamphlet which explained this. It was called People, Power and Real Democracy. So you, and I, I, I repeat, this is not you do the same or anybody else should do the same. You have to learn how to do it to fit your situation. I remember reading in Egypt, in the Egyptian Revolution, the bulletins produced by the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialists. So it was a strange language to me, I'd not seen it, but they found a language for arguing Marxist politics in relation to the language of the Egyptian uh, 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 Revolution. A lot of stuff about martyrs and so on. Good, fine, uh, because that, uh, 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 that fitted. And uh, this leads to uh, one uh, uh, more point. Um, it, it, it was raised by Sue, Sue Caldwell, um, when she says, and I made the same point, you know, that the Revolutionary Party is not a broad church, the Revolutionary Party is not uh, an alliance of revolutionaries and reformists. It's a revolutionary party. And it is a broad church in terms of uniting all, you know, black and white, straight and gay, all, all that sort of thing. Yeah, 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 that's all that's true. But in a situation where the revolutionary left are a tiny minority in the society, and this is where we are um, almost everywhere, like in the United States, for, uh, for example, but also, you know, it would be true in France. There was Mélenchon who 
was successful, not the revolutionary left. Be true in Germany, be true uh, in the Far East, yeah, you won't be serious. Okay, I'll, uh, this is my last point. <laughs> uh, in that situation, all right, I think we need to work at bridges between the spontaneous reformist or left reformist consciousness, between the OOO Jeremy Corbyn people, which is wonderful, and the Lenin people. We need bridges. So the Revolutionary Party doesn't become a broad, broad church embracing. It's clear on it's revolutionary, etc. It's not an alliance with reformism, but it needs bridges into it because we need because people are not going to go straight from are you oh 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 Jeremy Corbyn to uh, Lenin's state and revolution without some transition, and that is going to be true in America, and that's going to be true. so we need bridges in America, for example. This is just my thoughts in answer to your question. What if, I may be wrong about this, because I, I don't know the situation, but what if the ISO, the Seattle people, what socialist alternative, and the Democratic Socialists of America were able to make an alliance, you'd have tens of thousands of people that would be a serious alternative poll to the Clinton Democrats, I think. You know, could that be done? I don't know. But that's the kind of way we need some creative thinking uh, uh, on this in order to relate to Mélenchon supporters, Corbyn supporters, Sanders supporters. And, I, okay, we're coming to, just to say, the reason for this, come back to the point, is that we do not have unlimited time. We suffered major historical defeats. We've got to make them good to make uh, Lenin's, as i.e. revolutionary socialism, a reality to resolve the crisis of humanity. Thank you.